Welcome! Hop on board to hear an awesome story filled with drama, action, adventure, mystery, and more. The Adventures of Plymouth Plantation is told by the Mayflower Mouse. All our stories take a deep dive into American history. We share true tales about the brave men, women, and children that help shape our rich heritage. Today, our story celebrates the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrim's Landing in 1620 and introduces that exciting beginning of America's hometown, Plymouth. As the Pilgrims knew, in their hearts, it's for our children. Sometimes we take this story to Cape Cod, where the Pilgrims landed in the New World on a chilly day in November 1620. Sometimes we talk to the local Wampanoag to air out their ancestral stories about their culture. Sometimes we take the story to book signings and talk to local children about the courageous pilgrims. They can see the original artwork from the book, ask questions, and take home a book and a bookmark. Sometimes we take our stories to classrooms and libraries where students play the role of a story character, help with the maps, and share their own American history stories. Writing our story about the Pilgrims began at the State House Library, Boston. We went to read a priceless American treasure, William Bradford's Journal of Plymouth Plantation. Yes, it's a record about the pilgrims' struggles in Europe, the voyage across the Atlantic, settlement, survival, trade with the Wampanoag, and more. Governor Bradford wrote at the beginning of his journal, quote, I shall endeavor to manifest in a plain style the simple truth in all things. It's really fun to read a primary document. Let's take a look. Here's a sample page from the Bradford Journal. He has very neat, precise handwriting. You can examine it more closely and translate some of the early English. Paul examined a facsimile of the Bradford Journal about the Mayflower passengers, the first Thanksgiving festival in 1621, notes on the scriptures, and more. But who was William Bradford? We learned that Bradford was born in England in 1590. In his mid-teens, he joined a newly formed church. Fearing persecution in England, Bradford and other members moved to Amsterdam and then to Leiden in 1607. In Holland, Bradford worked long hours as a weaver, learned Dutch, Latin, and Hebrew, and acquired a sizable library. When the congregation decided to emigrate, Bradford helped arrange the trip across the Atlantic Ocean. He was a key leader, signed the Mayflower Compact, and served as governor of Plymouth Plantation for most of his life. It's all in his handwritten journal, but we'll let Mother Mouse start our story. Hello, I'm going to tell you about the English Pilgrim's arrival in the New World, a story kept deep in our hearts for generations. As Mother Mouse, I'll share what my great, 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 many greats Uncle Sam recorded in his journal back in 1620. The journal even includes his little sketches of several adventures and self-portraits. I'm repeating to you the timeless tale. It's family tradition. Every Thanksgiving we gather here in Chatham with family and friends and imagine the Mayflower sailing past this beach, not once, but twice. I imagine the view eastward is just the same as 400 years ago. And now, 
Let's hear from Uncle Sam's journal. Before the pilgrims left on their journey, I saw them meet with their pastor, John Robinson, just as I started my journal. He read from Ezra in the Bible. I love the part for our children, since a third of the Mayflower's passengers are children. This is what Bradford wrote in his journal. So being ready to depart, they had a day of solemn humiliation, their pastor taking his text from Ezra 8.21. And there at the river by Ahava, I proclaimed a fast that we might humble ourselves before our God and seek of him a right way for us and for our children. The voyage to the New World all starts back in Plymouth, England. A little girl clutches her doll as our castle-like ship slowly sails out of Plymouth Harbor against a prevailing westerly wind. I will be rocking in my clamshell, feeling the motion of the waves and the sway of the sea until we reach our destination. As we sail, I scurry around the ship here and there through my network of passengers. I overhear more details about our voyage. I hear that we're headed for the mouth of the Hudson River, where the Virginia Company has given us permission to establish a colony. A large, burly man speaks softly to a friend. It's really hard to leave family and friends behind, but now we can escape King James and no longer fear going to prison for not following the Church of England's teachings. Yes, his friend replies, I don't want to go to prison in England. We tried living in Holland, but that didn't work out so well for many of our families. Our children were becoming more Dutch than English. We've longed for our freedom for years. Settlement in Virginia promises that for us with land and an opportunity to worship freely in the new world. The passengers rejoice over the birth of Oceanus last night. Elizabeth and Stephen Hopkins tenderly hold their son, the first baby to be born on our voyage. I've never heard that name before. It fits because we're crossing the ocean. Will we ever make it across to the new world? It's another stormy day in October. I hear a loud noise under the deck near my clamshell. Uh-oh! One of the horizontal beams that supports the deck has cracked. Fortunately, I hear a quick thinking man shout. I'll use my great iron screw jack to support the failing beam. Strong hands repair the beam and fill the cracks. I watch the carpenter put a post under it, providing sound support. Whew! The passengers rejoice that all is well. They're thanking heaven that they don't have to return to England. Me too. Just when I think peace has returned, I hear a loud splash. Young John Holland disappears into the Atlantic during a day so windy that Master Jones orders all sails to be taken down. The top deck is very slippery. The ice-cold water makes me shiver. John is able to grab a trailing topsail rope and hang on for his life, even though he was some fathoms under the water. At last, the crew hauls him back aboard using a boat hook. Everyone cheers and gives thanks. Land ho! Yes, it is land, wooded to the brink of the sea. Word races through the Mayflower. Kneeling on the deck for morning prayer, they thank God and sing a hymn. After 66 days at sea, weary and damp, everyone rejoices. Alas, I hear this is not Virginia. It's Cape Cod. We were driven off course by the storms. 
shouts Master Jones. We head south towards Virginia, along the Cape, when the Mayflower pitches violently. Sandbars! Roaring breakers! warns Master Jones. Pray as you never prayed before. Fortunately, our prayers are heard. As twilight creeps in, the wind direction changes. A northeast wind fills the sails and pushes the Mayflower out into deep waters. We head northward, back up the sandy Cape Coast. Whew! What a relief! Now, there's a heated debate about what to do next. As we arrive at the tip of Cape Cod, before dropping anchor, the men agree to set their fears and differences aside and gather into the captain's great cabin to make a final decision. I see John Carver's pen scratching out something important. It's an agreement of unity to stay together, work together, and make fair laws for the new colony. It sounds promising to me. The first to sign this compact is John Carver. He will watch our newly formed colony as its first governor. Now, we're all one group. Call us pilgrims, he says as everyone shakes hands. By morning, 41 have signed the compact. I'm excited to watch William Bradford write in his journal that they promise to bind each other into a civil body politic. To me, that means they're going to stick together. The adventure of exploring the unknown begins. To survive, the pilgrims must find fresh water, a good harbor, and fields for spring planting. Right now, in this bitter weather, even I'm shivering in my fur coat. I jump on board the longboat with Captain Standish, William Bradford, John Alden, and several others. We row ashore with great expectations, climbing up and down the sand dunes and hiking through thick forests we explore. Oh no, I hear them saying, this harbor is too shallow and the little ponds will dry up by summer. Bradford writes about the wonderful water on our first discovery mission. And we drank our first New England water with as much delight as ever we drank in all our lives. The men set out on a second mission with Miles Standish and his 16 volunteers in single file, dressed in armor and carrying muskets, the men disappear up the coast. After two cold and rainy days, the explorers return. I hear Captain Standish say, we saw five natives who ran away too fast for us to meet them. We waved and shouted and followed their footprints for miles along the beach. We were wondering if they were from the Wampanoag tribe. European fishermen who have been here before us from France, Spain, and England said the Wampanoag live around the edge of Cape Cod and beyond in different tribes. Some wear scraps of European clothes. Some speak a few European words. Our explorers found an abandoned Wampanoag dwelling, a Wet'u. I wonder if mice are welcome there. It would be fun to live in these round homes covered with thatch and corn stalks. Miles Standish tells all of us about other adventures. We stumbled upon a treasure under a mound of dirt. In a small clearing, we found a cornfield, several large baskets filled with some Indian corn, and an iron kettle. The explorers know this stash of corn is a valuable source of seeds for spring planting and haul it away. The pilgrims plan to make payment later to the natives or return the corn someday to the beach we call Corn Hill. I fear they are in danger if they take these supplies. 
it's clear that they must concentrate on staying alive, and so must I. The next evening, I see Bradford writing his thoughts about this extraordinary journey. There were no friends to welcome them, nor in to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses or much less towns to repair to. What could not sustain them but ye Spirit of God and His grace? I'm freezing, although my fur grows thicker. We're all shivering as the temperatures continue to drop. Still, we have no place to call home. Let's make one more discovery trip, suggests Robert Coppin, the master's mate. There's a good river and harbor across the bay. I've been there. The shallop sets out shortly with Miles Standish and 17 men. I watch them until the boat disappears along the Cape coastline, gliding alongside dark and mysterious woods as the pilgrims search for a home. It's an entire week before the search party returns to the Mayflower. Again, we gather in the warm captain's cabin as the snow swirls outside the window. Now we hear from them their shocking story of First Encounter Beach. Miles Standish begins the tale. After sunset, we camped on the beach and made a fire to keep warm, he says. That evening, dreadful yells pierced the night air. We questioned if they were made by wild wolves or mysterious natives. Robert Copton adds, At dawn, after morning prayers, we were startled by a wild cry and arrows flying around us. I'm panning when I scurry to read Bradford's journal. I discover more details. It was an amazing adventure. I can hardly capture it all in my little diary. <clears throat> By their noise, we could not guess that they were less than 30 or 40. We took up 18 of their arrows. By the providence of God, none of them either hit or hurt us. So after we had given God thanks for our deliverance, we took our shallop and went on our journey. After hearing and then reading about this report of the First Encounter Beach, I find it easy to understand why this hostile region has been rejected for our home. Fortunately, Coppin promised that a good harbor was not far away. Immediately, the pilgrim leaders sailed along through a dark, windy day, determined to find it. After hours of sailing, it began to rain and snow, and the rudder broke. Later, I heard Bradford describe this extraordinary journey. The storm finally ended, and we landed on an island. Sunday was devoted to prayer, and Monday we rode to Plymouth, a name John Smith used for this place on his New England map. Bradford continued, We found a deep harbor. We found a safe place to settle with sweet water from brooks, trees for building homes, and empty fields. This high ground has a good view of the ocean. I hurried to read his journal at night. They fell upon their knees and blessed ye God of heaven who brought them over ye vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all ye perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on firm and stable earth, their proper element. I watch as these brave men wade through icy water from the shallop to shore and back. Unloading the Mayflower is slow, hard work. The ship is the only shelter until homes are built at Plymouth. As you can imagine, the living conditions are challenging as we work to find food and build shelters. 
daily our lives are at risk. Sadly, half of the settlers perish. One small band of pilgrims worked together to stay alive over the long winter. They saw pine logs to make planks and split cedar trees to make clapboards for new homes. Slowly, the warmer weather arrives and more small cottages are built. They look like the larger ones I saw in England, steep roofs covered with straw called thatch. We still haven't met the natives, and I wonder why they steal some of our unguarded garden tools. I couldn't believe my eyes and ears. A old native walks confidently into our settlement. Is this one of the Wampanoag we've been hearing about? He's tall and sturdy with eagle feathers braided into his long black hair. Welcome, Englishmen. The pilgrim men approach him slowly, trying not to appear startled. We find out that his name is Samoset, and he learned English from fishermen up north. Bradford writes, After eating and talking with the leaders, he's going to spend the night. I sense that goodwill and trade lie ahead. Believe it or not, Master Jones and his sailors must return the Mayflower to England. We anxiously watch from the shore as they sail away and fade over the eastern horizon. Not one single pilgrim or mouse wants to return. I did spot some rats hopping on board. As we settle in, we get to know and trade with a new culture who live in these round houses nearby. Samoset receives gifts from the pilgrim leaders, a knife, a ring, and a bracelet, and before long he returns with those stolen garden tools I wrote about. Several days later, other Indians arrive. Chief Massasoit, Squanto, and a number of warriors dressed in deerskin cloaks and leggings. Squanto speaks English with Governor Carver, who meets Massasoit and all the natives with respect. I watch as the pilgrims in Wampanoag sign a peace treaty. For as long as the moon rises, for as long as the grass grows green, for as long as the rivers flow, we will be friends. We will live in peace. I peek into these long and wide dwellings that have a small fire in the middle for warmth. The sleeping platforms are covered with animal skins to keep the families warm on cold nights. I'll keep out of their way. I smell the smoke as a Wampanoag slowly burns out the interior of a huge canoe with hot coals. He works for days using a stone and hardwood scraper to shape the sides and bottom. I saw this tall, straight white pine by the bank of the Eel River near the majestic elm and chestnut trees. Squanto becomes not only a friend, but also our guide and interpreter with local natives. Thank heaven he teaches us how to gather nuts and berries from the woods and how to find the best fishing waters. It's spring, and the pilgrims ask Squanto about the best time to plant. We need to grow our own food to survive. Squanto says with a smile, When the oak leaves are as big as a mouse's ear. Really? Around the campfire, I listen to the pilgrims make arrangements to pay the native people back for the corn the men stole last winter, not forgetting their promise to repay. And I hear that the pilgrims will give some of their hoes to the Wampanoag to help them grow much more corn. Thanks to Squanto, we expect a great harvest of our first corn. 
gardens begin to grow in the backyards and fields. The plants grow much better with a fat fish added to the soil as a fertilizer. It's our tradition, advises Guanto. Planting begins with the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. The smaller gardens include beets, lettuce, and herbs. We'll be well fed for sure. Our new governor, Bradford, and his wife, Alice, have a simple cottage like the other pilgrims, furnished with what they brought from England. Warm blankets, colored cloth, wooden chests, books, pewter dishes, and kettles. Some of these might be used for trading. I only brought my journal. Alice gets to read William's journal first when she's not reading her Bible. From my years young in youth, God did make known to me the truth and called me from my native place for to enjoy the means of grace. In wilderness he did me guide and in strange lands for me provide. In fears and wants, through weal and woe, a pilgrim passed I to and fro. Dear Diary, I can't write anything this summer. We are so busy getting our houses built, planting crops, weeding our gardens, going to church meetings, fishing, and exploring. The children help with cleaning the cottages and harvesting crops before they play marbles and other games. The harvest is good and our hearts are grateful. Plans are in the works for a harvest festival. Governor Bradford sends some men to hunt deer, geese, and turkeys. No mice. The day for the celebration arrives. Here comes Chief Massasoit with 90 squaws, braves, and children. Good thing that they're bringing five deer to our feast so there's enough food for all. We eat and celebrate for three days with games, target shooting, dancing, and singing hymns. Thankfully, no one has stepped on my tail. Yet. During the festivities, the pilgrims give thanks for safely crossing the sea and getting through a cruel winter. They give thanks for the fruits of the earth, the friendship with the Wampanoag, and a place at last that's free where they can worship and pray as they choose. Edward Winslow said, By the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. For now, I'll end my diary on a happy note. I could sing like a bird about all the bittersweet adventures of the past year, severe cold, hunger, and heartbreak, overcome by the pilgrims' faith, unity, and tenacity to keep to their purpose. The music lingers on in my thoughts. Part of this amazing journey is captured in my journal and in Governor Bradford's. I'll cherish many lessons of working together for the good of all. Let your light shine. Governor Bradford gets the last words. As one small candle may light a thousand, so the light kindled here has shone unto many. I hope you've enjoyed this true tale of courage and faith. Every year, celebrate the Pilgrim's Landing in 1620. It's for our children. Now, you can write a chapter or two of your own story. What journeys has your family taken? You are the Pilgrims of today. Follow your dreams. Perhaps you won't sail to new countries, but new adventures are just around the corner. Your journal can capture your thoughts and many experiences. 
If you want to learn more about the 1620 Pilgrims, take some trips with your family and discover amazing adventures. Have fun exploring the Alden's home in Duxbury, Massachusetts, where they raised 10 children. How many stories do you think were told in that house? No, these are not exercise wheels or mice, but important spinning wheels on the second floor of the Alden home. Imagine their busy days on the farm, spinning, weaving, cooking, cleaning, planting, harvesting, plus a fur trade business. They had quiet time on the farm to read the Bible and sip English tea. Be like a pilgrim. Work hard. Play. Read. Explore. Set your goals. Have faith. Find your dreams. Keep a journal. Celebrate. If you keep a wide vision and a warm heart, you'll be welcome in many lands. Sail away, pilgrims, with your heritage of freedom. Freedom.